Hi everybody, I hope that you're doing well. We are into session eight. It's our final episode of our Golden Thread series. Today we're gonna to be thinking about Jesus and how he's the fulfillment of all of the prophecies of the Old Testament, but also how the whole of the Golden Thread points towards him. Before we do so, let's look at a quick basics. So as we come to the end of our Golden Thread, you might be asking the question, where do I turn to next? I wanna carry on reading the Bible, but I just don't know where to start or how to do it. Well, let me give you a couple of tips, things that I've found personally extremely helpful in my life. The first thing is have a think about using Bible notes. Now, Bible notes are excellent and quite often they're free. You can have them posted to your door. You can also find them online as emails, or if you've got Bible apps, you can even find plans that you can pick and choose that you wanna do, and they'll come um, as a notification each and every day. I wanna encourage you to try and read the Bible every day. It doesn't have to be too long. You, you might wanna read for an hour or so. You might wanna read for 10, 15 minutes. Whatever it is, it's still beneficial. Start small and work your way up. So let's have a think about Bible notes. How do they work? They ne nearly always follow the same format. They'll be dated or numbered so you can keep track of where you're up to. And if you miss out days, then don't feel the pressure to go back and try and do two or three days in one go. Just keep picking up that days and carry on reading from where you are. The Bible notes, as I say, they follow a similar format. They'll give you a, a day to start with, then they'll give you a Bible passage to read, and then they'll give you a short thought or reflection from it. This has been written by an external author. So quite often, they'll, as, they, as they've read the passage for themselves, they'll give you some thoughts. So test what's being said, and then it might finish with a prayer or some prayer points. Don't feel limited by the Bible notes. If you wanna read more around that passage, go for it. Read a bigger portion of scripture. If you feel that the Bible notes there are helpful, but you've got your own thoughts, then sit with a journal and jot them down for yourself. If you feel like the prayer time is a good place to start, but there's more things to pray about based on what you've read, do that as well. As we come to read the Bible, we should always seek to start in prayer. Ask God to help us. When we do that, it's like having the author of the book sitting with us and directing us and saying, this is what I meant when I when I had this written. So ask God and invite him into your time of Bible reading. Ask him to direct your eyes, your thoughts, and to be able to read what he wants you to read that day. And then as you reflect on the passage, ask the question, what does this mean to me? What should I do based on what I've read? And then finally in your prayer time, Ask God to give you everything you need to be able to carry out what he has commanded you through his word. Or maybe you wanna spend time in praise based on what you've read and say how great God is from what's been recorded. That's Bible notes. The second helpful resource is Bible commentaries. And maybe you're gonna pick a book to read through. So for example here, I've got a concordance or a commentary on um, Galatians. It's written by a man called John Stott. And so what he's done is he's read Galatians and he's done all the research behind the book so that as you read Galatians from your Bible, have this open as well, and you can understand more of what Galatians is saying in its context. Bible commentaries are really helpful and quite often I use them when I'm preparing sermons or indeed just reading for myself saying, what does this actually mean in this context? There are loads of them available. And there are loads of really well-known and trusted Bible scholars that you can get the most out of. They've done all the hard work so that you can understand the passage more. Can I encourage you, like I've already said, to read the Bible and to seek to do it every day. For me, myself, I'm going through the Bible in a year. And so I'm using a Bible app to just help me so I can pick it up wherever I am. And if I've got a few spare minutes, I can read a bit more or, or dive into some other things. See, I wanna see that big picture, that golden thread in the whole counsel of God throughout every single page. Can I encourage you to read the Bible for yourself and to be excited by what you find on those pages? 
Well, as we come to the end of our eight sessions together, as we've explored this golden thread, each session you may have noticed that we came to Jesus at the end. And that's as we looked at that golden thread of the gospel, meaning good news. In fact, we, we couldn't help but look at Jesus each and every time. That's because the Old Testament points towards the Saviour that's going to come and rescue us. And as Christians, we believe that that Saviour is Jesus. So let's ask the question, how do we know that it's Jesus? This man could be anybody. Where's the proof? Where's the evidence? And what are you going to do with that evidence? A man by the name of Professor Peter Stoner, he, uh, he lived a couple of decades ago and he started to do some mathematical calculations to try to figure out the probability of Jesus or anybody indeed fulfilling eight of those Old Testament prophecies. Prophecy is something that's written um, in history about something in the future. So what is the chance of Jesus fulfilling just eight of them? Well, according to his studies, he reckons that it was 1 in 10 to the power of 17. That number looks a lot like this. Now, in those days, when Peter was writing, they had dollar coins. And so his illustration was that you were able to cover um, the whole of Texas with dollar, silver dollar coins, but not just once. You could do it to the depth of two feet. That's how big that number is. And he said that if you marked one coin, and then sent one man into Texas blindfolded and randomly picked up that coin that you'd marked, that would be the chance of fulfilling eight of the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's insane, isn't it? Yet Jesus, he, he fulfilled eight prophecies. Then Peter Stoner went on to do some more calculations and he reckoned that if, uh, if Jesus was able to fulfill 48 of the prophecies, what would the chances of that be? Well, he reckons it would be 1 in 10 to the power of 157. Now, I have no idea if I've done this right, but I think it looks a bit like this. Now, that number can't be given as an illustration in silver dollar coins, okay? That number is far too big. The amazing thing is, is that Jesus didn't just fulfill eight of the Old Testament prophecies. He didn't just fulfill 48 of the Old Testament prophecies. It's believed that Jesus, as people have tried to count them, and, and obviously some people have counted more than others and recognized other things as prophecies. So, so let's go with the conservative estimate of more than 300 prophecies written about him. Jesus fulfilled more than 300. That number in terms of one in, the, in 10 to the power of whatever is just astronomical. Yet Jesus fulfilled them. Let's look at some examples. First of all, let's look at Jesus' birth. Now, when Jesus was born, we read this in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 6. It's talking about the, uh, the Magi or the, the wise men, okay? Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Jerusalem. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Within that, this passage here, we get a double whammy. First of all, we have these wise men coming from the east. And if you think back to the last session, Babylon, where Daniel was exiled to from uh, Judah, he was taken to the east. Now, it's believed that these wise men were actually gauging times and looking for the star based on Daniel's prophecies. And so the wise men, when they see this star rise, they, they come towards uh, Jerusalem. And as they reach Herod, Herod is troubled. He, he's not sure um, what to make of it. So he turns to the scribes and the chief priests, those that know the Tanakh, the Old Testament for Christians. And as they search through, they see what the prophet wrote. 
This is the prophet Micah. And this is found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, when he talks about the birth of Jesus coming to a small town called Bethlehem. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy even in the place where he was born. But it's not just that. You see, Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And so here we have Mary, a virgin, who is pledged to be married to Joseph, and she finds out that she's pregnant. And when God speaks to her, he says that the child within her is conceived of the Holy Spirit. And he is God, God with us. Jesus fulfilling prophecies again. Now these aren't small things like you'll have a packet of crisps on a Tuesday, something stupid like that. These are major events, the place where he'd be born, and also the fact that he will be born of a virgin, a miracle, impossible to happen unless God is in control. Jesus is more than a man. Jesus is that promised Messiah. Let's also look at um, some parts of his life as well. You see, as Jesus stood up to speak in uh, Luke chapter 4, we read this. As he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll that the, of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovering the sight of the blind. He has set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see, even Jesus says, look at the Old Testament prophecies. Look at how they're fulfilled in me. I am the Messiah, I am that promised one, I am Christ, which is Greek meaning King, the anointed one. It is me, I am the one you have been waiting for. Now think of some of those things that he's just said, because in Matthew chapter 11, we have a really interesting account where John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus and says this, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And so the disciples of John the Baptist do that. And this is Jesus' answer in Matthew chapter 11, verse 4. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you see, what you hear and see. The blind shall receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. What was the evidence and the answer that Jesus was giving these disciples? He said, look at what I'm doing. Look at how the Old Testament has been fulfilled in me. Look at how the the lame are walking, how the blind can see, how the lepers are cleansed, how the poor are receiving the good news, the gospel preached to them. Can you see this? Jesus is saying, there's the prophecy in Isaiah and here's me fulfilling those prophecies. Even as Jesus rode into Jerusalem a week before he was crucified, he rode in on a donkey. It's known by Christians as Palm Sunday because the people took palm leaves and they threw them on the floor in front of Jesus so he could walk in on a carpet. Even the donkey is prophesied about. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout, O daughter Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And as you read about Palm Sunday, you'll see that Jesus doesn't ride in on a horse. He rides in on a donkey. But not just any donkey, 
a foal, a colt, a young donkey that has never been ridden before. Jesus fulfilling those prophecies. Now these aren't things that Jesus read in the Tanakh and, and in the Torah and then just sought to fulfill himself. As we've seen, the, the miracles have been done. The place where he was born, he had no say over that at all. Um, humanly speaking, of course, as God, he did. And even here, as the young cult of a donkey, he just sent his disciples and said, you're going to find a donkey tied up. And if anybody asks, say, the, the master needs it. And they'll give it to you. And so that is exactly what happened. And so, as we look at Jesus' life, as we look at the amazing miracles that he has done, we should see them all as signs that Jesus is that promised one. And so as we look at, upon the cross, we should also trust what's written about that as well. You see, the Bible says that each and every one of us is dead in our sin. The Bible says that because we have rejected God, we're born into that, but we also choose to do that as well. Then we are not good enough. We are not perfect. We are not spotless. And we will not be accepted into God's presence. Now, of course, here today we experience God's common grace with all the good things in our lives. However, one day we will face God as our judge. And we have no other option or outcome than to be judged guilty because of our sin. And that's the gospel. That's the good news. The first of all that we recognize that we're sinners because God doesn't leave it there. But then he sends his one and only son into the world so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. John chapter 3 verse 16. You see, as Jesus came into the world, Emmanuel, God with us, he eventually hung upon a cross. The Bible says that as he hung upon the cross, our sin was placed upon him and God poured out that judgment that we deserved. He poured it out upon Jesus. Jesus is our Passover lamb, as we thought about with Moses. He is the sacrifice that we need. And now the Bible says that if we trust in Jesus, if we ask him for forgiveness and we turn from rejecting God and we trust in him, then we can find forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Jesus' death and resurrection is the pinnacle, not just of the Christian faith, not just of my life, but of all humanity as well. The moment when God came as that sacrifice for each and every one of us. But not everyone will receive that gift. Only those who trust in him as that promised Messiah. So, as Jesus rose again, Paul, many years after this, wrote, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he has raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. You see, Jesus did die upon the cross, but Jesus did come back to life. He was resurrected on the third day. Jesus is alive today. And he appeared to the disciples. In fact, it says here that he appeared to more than 500 brothers. And we, we guess that also means women as well. So more than 500 people all in one go. People saw the scars, the spear marks in his side, the hands, and the holes in his hands and, and his feet as well. And they saw that he's alive. No one else could come back to life like that apart from the Savior promised of old the one that we can trust in. And so finally, as Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, an angel stood next to the disciples as they watched him go. And he said this, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so we see here 
another promise that is set to be fulfilled. All the prophecies of the Old Testament that point towards the Saviour are met in Jesus Christ. And as he ascends into heaven, the disciples are given another promise. In fact, we are given it as well, that in the same way that he went, one day he will return. And so in 2020, or maybe you're watching this in the future, whatever year it is, then know this, that there is still a promise to be fulfilled, that Jesus will come back. And my question to you today is, are you willing to trust in him? Are you willing to, to read this golden thread of the gospel and not just have it as head knowledge, but actually let it transform your life? I'm going to pray now, and I'd just like you to, to join with me. Uh, maybe this is the, the time you pray this uh, prayer for the very first time, or maybe for some of us it might be a time where you're thinking, you know what, I need to come back to Jesus. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray and I'm going to thank Jesus for coming and dying for us. I'm going to recognize that he is God, that he died upon the cross for my sin and your sin, and also that, that we want to say sorry and ask for forgiveness, and we want to turn our hearts to him. And if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, then please get in touch with us um, because we'd love to be able to support you and maybe send some resources your way to help you on that Christian journey that you've now taken as you trust in and follow the golden thread of the gospel. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gospel. Lord, I thank you that it points towards you. Lord, we know that without you, we would be lost in our sin. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you are God. Please forgive me and help me to follow after you. For I ask this in your name. Amen. Well, that's it. We've reached the end. I just want to say a special thank you to Stan, who's been spell checking for me. And uh, Stan, I think you'd agree there's been a lot of spellings to check, hasn't there? So thanks for that. And uh, I just want to say, if you've got any questions or you'd like to know a little bit more, then why not get in touch with us? You can do that either through um, our Instagram page. You can do that through our Bethel website as well. Um, or maybe a phone number if you have one of them. And however you're watching this, I hope that you've enjoyed them. I hope that you've learned something new. But most of all, I hope that it's ignited your passion to read God's word for yourself and to go on your own exploration of that golden thread. So, God bless and take care.